So lastly uh, is the U of T program. Um, their program is called the Consortium of Physician Assistant Education, sorry, University of Toronto Physician Assistant Program. And that graduates students with the Bachelor of Science degree. Uh, and Casey will present the requirements. All righty. Um, so this is the requirements for 2021 to 2022 cycle. Um, so firstly, you have to be a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident of Canada. Um, and if English isn't your first language, then an English, English language profic proficiency test. Um, you need to have a minimum of four semesters of your undergrad degree. Um, the minimum cumulative GPA is um, a 2.7 um, out of a 4.0. Um, you need a minimum of 100 healthcare hours. Um, and then the supplemental application, which comes out a little bit later on in the year. Um, and you need one reference. Um, the preferred criteria yeah, I do believe it. I believe Selena's right. I do believe it is a 3.0 this year. And was it a. 100? So it, it's not 3.0 this year, it's 2022 23. Okay. So okay. This year is still 2.7 out of four, and you still like need the reference letter. And then 2022 23, it's 3.0 out of 4.0. And instead of a reference letter, your reference actually just submits a form and answers questions or something along those lines. Um, yeah. Right, right, okay. Um, and then the preferred criteria is to have a human anatomy and physiology course, um, the healthcare experience within the past five years. Um, and it's preferred to have like direct hands-on patient care um, versus a more indirect role. Um, paid positions are preferred as well. Um, a current resident of Ontario, and also um, it is a plus if you live in the northern regions or rural communities. Okay, so um, I'm going to be doing the timeline. So you submit your, um, you apply for your UAC application, sorry, and like I think it's late September, early October, um, and then that needs to be in by January 18th. And then you get your supplemental application um, and your transcripts, uh, which uh, do go through UAC. Um, and the POELC, if uh, um, required, needs to be in by February 1st, as well as your reference letter. Um, and um, the reference also needs to submit um, like a comp competency sheet, I think. Um, if I remember correctly, and that also needs to be submitted by uh, February 1st, and then uh, MMI invites go out mid, eight, mid um, April, and then you do your MMI early May, and then around the end of May application, or sorry, acceptances are sent out. And then um, I also believe that we started August 31st, if that's correct. Yes. Okay, Casey. Yeah. So we also started a week before undergrad started. All right, so just due to time, I'm gonna go over to the uh, U of T's components now. Um, so we will have current U of T students, Carolyn and Casey answering questions, as well as Selena, who was accepted to both Mac and U of T. So U of T only requires one reference for this application cycle, which you need to have uh, known for at least three months. This reference has to be from someone who has knowledge of your performance as a healthcare provider and can provide um, and can answer statements about your character, clinical abilities, et cetera. Uh, there are more requirements for the reference, so please refer to U of, uh, U of T's program website. Um, it is to note that it, this isn't a letter of recommendation, but it's a, it's a link. It's a, um, your references will be sent a link to complete the applicant reference form, but it's still very important to make sure they, your reference does get it in online, uh, in time, sorry. So who did you use as a reference? Um, so I used my manager um, at Life Labs where I was um, a phlebotomist there. So I knew her for about two years and I picked her because uh, prior to her being a manager, she was also my colleague and she trained me, which I thought was pretty um, 
uh, pretty interesting because she can comment on my work capability as well as my personal capability and personal experience as well. Um, I used one of my supervisors at um, my current job. I worked for people with intellectual disabilities um, and she had been with the organization for about 20 years. Um, and she worked with me in, I worked in group homes and she worked with me in the homes so she could see me interacting with the residences. And um, I felt that she could speak upon my, uh, my clinical skills as well as like my, um, my like personal skills as well. So I thought she was a good person to ask. So for myself, I kind of have a little bit of a different take on this. So um, because I worked as a medical attendant or um, for like a patient transfer company, I don't work under direct supervision. So um, I didn't want to put a supervisor or a manager because they're not on the road with me. They don't see me in the hospitals interacting with my patients. So I chose a coworker that I worked with quite frequently for three years um, at two different companies. So um, I felt as though he could best um, vouch for me and speak on how I am with patients and my character. So that's why I chose a coworker. However, I think it is preferred to choose a supervisor if you can, but if you don't work under direct supervision, then you can put a coworker, which was my situation. When did you ask for your reference? Um, I personally asked as soon as possible just to get her, um, just so that she was aware. And then, like um, Laurel said, I kind of gave her a deadline because I really wanted to be in before the holidays. So I really asked her if she could have it done prior to um, late Christmas. I asked, I would say I asked lightly before November, but I really asked um, her in November and I sat down and kind of told her um, what I needed her to do. And um, we discussed it a little further in November. So for myself, I also asked in November, but I kind of had brought it up um, previously. I would say, you know, ask as early as possible because people need to take that time to reflect and actually think, okay, why would this person be a great PA? How have they um, showed all of these strengths that they're going to talk about? And, you know, people have busy lives. Um, the person that I asked is a paramedic now. So um, I knew he'd be super busy. So I just thought to ask um, as soon as I could. And I also wanted mine in before Christmas. So pre-asked questions about references. So what are your recommendations for references for U of T? How did you choose your reference and what do you think is the best source for a reference? So maybe we can have someone, those are similar questions. So if we can have someone answer that. Um, I can go. I think um, for like, how do you choose your reference? I think it's important. Um, I say time and time again, that you pick a reference that can speak on you personally rather than professionally. I think um, it's better to be like for your reference to speak that way so that they're not just saying like, oh yes, like Carolyn is good at dealing with patients or Carolyn is good at uh, time management. But you want somebody who can really speak to um, and like say an example as to why you're good at these things and really dive deep into that. So the admission committee can really understand who you are and what type of person you are and, and how it could be um, attributed to you being a good PA. Is, so the next question is, is a reference from outside Canada accepted? I'm not too sure if you students, if you know that the answer. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I, I don't think I read anywhere that it wasn't accepted, but I would probably email the admissions, but unless any of you guys know. Yeah, no, I agree. Either I would also email the admissions committee just to make sure. Yeah. Awesome. So healthcare hours, um, they are only required by U of T. Uh, and some of, some of you may know that in previous cycles, 910 hours were, were required, but given the COVID-19 pandemic, securing healthcare, uh, healthcare roles has been really difficult, which is why the program has reduced the minimum number of hours to 100. Uh, again, I wanna preface, this is just for this application cycle. This may change next time for the next cycle. You do need at least two healthcare experiences, which can be obtained through employment, clinical placements, or volunteer. 
there are more requirements. Um, so please refer to their website for all that information. So Carolyn, um, where did you get your healthcare hours from? So um, my two, uh, first I worked at Life Labs as a mobile phlebotomist. And what that intakes is I traveled to patient homes, to long-term care facilities and to correctional facilities. And I drew blood and um, I performed ECGs. And then I worked as a war clerk in the hospital on the surgical floor. So basically I was processing patient charts and inputting um, like blood work or like um, procedures into the computer and helping the nurses as much as I could. Um, for my role, so I worked in group homes um, for people with disabilities, um, and I pretty much helped with their activities of daily living. I dealt with a lot of medications. I also was on a clinical care team for one of the gentlemen who lived there, um, so I had a lot of um, interprofessional collaboration. I worked really closely um, with a nurse, um, with a physician, and with multiple other um, healthcare practitioners. Um, and for that job, I only had to have my undergrad degree. I didn't have to have any other, um, um, any other requirements. Um, and then my next role, I worked as a physiotherapy assistant, um, at a long-term care home for about 130 of my hours. Um, another thing I would like to mention is that I've had a few questions about, people who've had, who have more than um, two healthcare experiences, because you only can speak on two, um, and like deciding which one they should include and which one they shouldn't. Um, in my personal opinion, I think you should include the ones that you can speak um, the most about and the ones that you've gained most value from. Um, and that, I guess, would be more relevant to the program. Okay, so um, just I was just looking at the chat. I believe if you only have one experience, you can just put one. I remember on my application, it said like, did you have another experience? And then you could go and add another. But I believe for myself and my experience, two is the maximum. In the past, it was more. So I'm not sure what it's going to be like this year. Um, but in terms of my healthcare hours, I had about um, 1,250 as a medical attendant. So basically what I did in that role was um, I worked with a variety of different healthcare professionals. I was basically transferring patients from different departments of different healthcare facilities, whether that was hospitals, long-term cares, um, to their homes, appointments, um, wherever they needed to go. So um, it's basically like I was working um, in a patient transfer ambulance, just not emergent cases like EMS or paramedics would do. So um, that was direct patient care and that was a paid position. Um, and I felt as though I got a lot of really good experience from that just because I really got to work in an interdisciplinary healthcare team. Um, my second experience was as a field research assistant for a study at McMaster. It's called the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So that was an indirect experience. So in that um, role, I was just calling participants and doing COVID questionnaires and surveys for a COVID-19 antibody um, testing studies. So we would send them kits in the mail and they would do an antibody test. So those were my experiences. Um, like Casey was saying, for myself personally, I had more experiences, but I kind of chose the two that I felt were most diverse and could show different parts of my personality. So my field research assistant was more public health related and my medical attendant was more clinical. So that's kind of why I chose um, those positions. Um, and were they paid or volunteer? Um, so I'll just, everyone answered the same. So both positions for all three of our students were paid, um, but again, volunteer does count. But, and if anyone wants to just add in anything they want, um, um, you can move on. Yeah. I'll just add in really quick that volunteer and research, um, like Selena's um, re field research assistant is uh, considered as well. We can't really speak to whether the admissions committee will recognize like all of the different types of experience, whether it be paid volunteer or research. Um, and even on their website, it says that they cannot disclose that either just for questions in the, in the chat there. Yeah, and something else I've also been asked a few times about um, shadowing. I don't believe shadowing is counted. I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think it has to be either volunteer or a paid position. Um, 
So that's just something else to think about. Um, shadowing is great, but I don't think like shadowing would be great to get exposure to what PAs do and to really determine if you want to, you know, um, pursue a career in this profession, but I don't think it's required for admissions or considered. To quickly add to what Selena said, um, you can talk about like shadowing and stuff on like your supplemental application if there's um, room for it. So even though you can't put it down as healthcare experience, you can still speak to it. Awesome. So we did have um, many questions with uh, in regards to healthcare hours. Um, so maybe if we could just do a students, if you could do a quick run through them and um, so that we can kind of get through the information. So something I will say, I'm just kind of reading the questions here. Um, I think as long for the third question there, um, I think as long as you have over the 100, you're good to apply. Um, that's something that I kind of stress. If you meet the requirement, there's no harm in applying and just going through the process and seeing who knows, maybe it'll work out, right? So um, I know I spoke to someone at U of T that got in with just over the minimum requirement. So I don't think it's like, you know, you need over a thousand or 2000 hours to gain acceptance. I think it's more how you can speak on those experiences and also the other parts of your application. Yeah, and you, you kind of speak to the first question as well. Um, it's really about making your other, if you're, if you don't have healthcare hours, you make other experiences more important. Um, do you guys have any suggestions for people who don't have any training and how to get started with healthcare hours? So I can speak to this one. Um, so I didn't have any training when I applied to Life Labs for Phlebotomist. They actually trained me there um, and I applied many, many times. So it does take some time, but I would just really, really reinforce, like keep applying, keep putting your name out there. Like it's gonna keep coming across. Um, same thing for like the work work at the hospital. I think when I did my, or submitted my resume, I applied to like 13 other jobs at the hospital too. Just really trying to get some experience. Awesome. So this is the last component we will discuss today, which is the supplemental application. In previous cycles, you would list your healthcare experiences and then answer questions uh, that are similar to a personal statement. In these previous cycles, there was a maximum word limit of 250 or a maximum character limit of 1,500. Um, applicants only receive the link to fill out this supplemental application form after they submit their OUAP form. Um, so since this document isn't available to the general public, the ap application can vary from what I just said. So I would advise you to go to the program, program website to learn more. But in general, how, how, what would you guys suggest to be concise in, in, in a word limit? So I started mine right away um, and I read through it and read through it and read through it and rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it. And I just really tried to um, make it as concise as possible, like, but then still trying to get my point across, um, get somebody else to read it. I got other PAs to read it. I got my mom to read it. I got teachers to read it. Um, just any, anything that you can. I also just want to point out that, um, not to frighten anybody, but when I went to submit it, um, really focus on that character, um, maximum because I do believe it counts like spaces or something like that because I had to reduce mine so just really keep in mind um, that uh, character and word limit. Um, it was kind of similar for me I just um, and I have a hard time being concise um, so I wrote out my answers multiple times. Um, I got multiple people to look over for look over it and um, just make sure it was uh, flowing well. And just um, a lot of the people who I sent it to had a lot of, or had some ideas on it, like how do you shorten it and like better words to use to make it more concise. Um, I also, yeah, that's pretty much what I did. So for myself, what I did first is I kind of wrote out a rough draft. I will admit, I probably went through like 40 drafts. I'm not even joking. Some questions took longer than others, but um, yeah, I thought it was 250 words. And then I kind of like just went to go put it into the SUP app and it cut me off like three quarters of the way through. Um, I emailed the program and it does, for my experience, it did go by characters. Maybe they changed that this year, but um, my answers were probably around like 220 to 230. Cause I think it, 
they consider 250 words as if every word was five characters. So um, just be cognizant of that. Um, I think it, from my experience, it was 1500 characters. Um, so, you know, it's very important to be concise and kind of get to the point. Um, you know, big fancy words are great, but it's, I would rather use more concise words and get more um, information that or points that could prove that I would be a great PA in rather than using those big words. Um, so like I said, just get your point across in an articulate way. Do you have experience with rural Northern underserved communities? So I live in Thunder Bay, which is um, definitely in Northwestern Ontario. Um, so the hospital here, we actually service, like I said, there was like a large catchment area. So I think we service like from the Manitoba border all the way up to um, like, what lake is that? Lake, lake all the way up to like the top of um, Ontario. And then just like um, before, like where, like at Sudbury or Timmins or something like that. So it's huge. So every like big case, um, if it doesn't have to go to Toronto, it actually comes to Thunder Bay. So we see lots of underserved, underserved communities um, uh, and people that come here or yeah, to Thunder Bay. And they, it's really just like a culture shock. Like lots of them don't even have street lights or drinking water. So I really focus on that a lot in my application because I do see it on a daily basis. Um, so I didn't have experience working in these communities. However, I have spent every summer since I was little up in Northern Ontario. Um, and my grandparents used to live there and they actually had, um, there was multiple times where they had troubles ac accessing um, healthcare. So I did speak a bit about that on my uh, supplemental application. So for myself, um, when I was working as a medical attendant, there were um, various amount of times where I would be transferring patients from urban centers, so either Hamilton or Toronto, back to these northern or rural communities. And um, through that experience, I was able to really see these health inequities that people in these communities are facing. So that brought a lot of awareness to um, the health inequities for myself. I also did pursue a Master of Public Health degree. So a large part of that program was learning about these inequities and how to help narrow this health gap. So I did learn a lot about that in those courses as well. Last question. What are, in your opinions, the pros and cons of the distance and uh, distributed delivery method U of T uses? Um, I'll go first. And sorry, Prada, I just want to add to the supplemental application that Anne, um, yeah. if you're part of her email list, she sends out um, many helpful emails. And within that, when the supplemental application comes, you can also um, get her and her colleagues to review it. Um, since I was a reapplicant, I definitely took that advantage, advantage sorry, um, and I did use that. So just to put that out there. Um, but pros and cons. So pros, I only applied to U of T because I absolutely loved like being in my safe zone. I'm very homebody, especially because like um, University of Toronto or like McMaster or something like that, that's super far for me. And I, and I love my little home. Um, and I love being uh, able to do it at your own pace. And when you're able to, I like doing it at night better than during the day. So um, those are really big pros for me. And cons, of course, you do have to sometimes teach yourself. Um, and if you don't understand something, like it may be difficult, but you really do have your colleagues to help you or your classmates. And then you also don't get to see your classmates as often, which does um, kind of suck. But. Um, so mine's very similar to uh, Carolyn's. Um, so the pros are the flexibility, um, also the traditional learning and um, problem-based learning mix. Um, the cons is, yeah, there's, um, we do have synchronous classes, but we do have asynchronous classes as well. So sometimes it's a little hard to um, stay motivated. However, <laughs> I found it super beneficial to kind of, I'll plan out my week and then the night before I'll review what I'm going to do for the next day. Um, so that's been good as well. Um, it also, yeah, um, we did have our um, campus block, which was super nice to see it, our classmates and everything, but it does um, suck that I'm not around my classmates all the time. So for myself, um, personally, the cons did outweigh the pros, unfortunately, but I would say the pros of um, distance learning is, you know, you do get to live with your support system um, and you get to learn in the comfort of your own home, which was something that I thought was awesome. But 
Unfortunately for myself, the cons were just having that social isolation from your classmates. I feel that like for myself at Mac, we're kind of all in this together. We see each other and it's a lot more comforting where unfortunately at U of T, you know, you can still contact your classmates, but you don't get to see them as much in person. Um, in terms of the res blocks, I was more a fan of how McMaster has weekly in-person sessions rather than res blocks. And personally, I'm just not the biggest fan of online lectures. Um, I find it hard to stay focused for whatever reason. I'd kind of rather just go in person and learn where I'm kind of forced to um, stay on track and stay focused. And um, for myself, I was kind of just over the lecture style and I wanted to learn something new and adjust to a new way of studying, which is why I was drawn to McMaster's PBL style of learning.